Knights. And mounted knights were not much use against stone walls. A siege against a castle could take weeks, even months. The attacking army pitted against a well-defended garrison within. By the end of the 13th century, the science of defensive architecture had reached a peak. Stone walls were built thicker and taller than ever before, and archers could easily pick off advancing attackers. To further frustrate attempts at breaching the walls, castles were situated on rocky crags or surrounded by water. But every advance in castle defense drove attackers to devise better siege weapons. During the Middle Ages, castles kept improving. They kept improving as weapons of attack got better. And tactics was this eternal balance between attack and defense. Heave! 200 years before cannon appeared in Europe, chroniclers make reference to what appears to be the ultimate 13th century siege weapon. An ingenious new form of heavy artillery that flung huge stone balls with such destructive power that castle walls were reduced to rubble. But no ancient weapon of this type has survived. Were such claims gross exaggerations? Or did such a weapon really exist? To answer these questions, Nova brings together a team of experts in medieval warfare who believe they know the secret. Chaos. It's Wednesday, I think. I don't have a clue whether or not we'll finish. The task? To build siege machines capable of destroying a castle wall at a range of about 200 yards. Oh, I think that the thing will smash it up nicely, yeah. And with just two weeks to meet the challenge, a siege mentality quickly sets in. I was just seeing it start no advance. modern builders have ever managed to do this before. This interplay between defenders and siegers, it's, it's still up in the air. We could still take it, then again, we could fail. It's sort of in the lap of the gods. From Edward Longshanks, more formally known as King Edward I of England, mounted the greatest siege of his reign against the Scots and their castle at Stirling. The attack dragged on. Impatient for victory, Edward ordered 50 carpenters to immediately begin building a monstrous new weapon. So powerful, it would breach the strong walls of Stirling Castle. Details about the weapon design are tantalizingly vague, except that it was nicknamed Warwolf, and its appearance outside the walls terrified the garrison. Was it the atomic bomb of the Middle Ages? With one blow, Warwolf leveled a section of wall, successfully concluding the siege of Stirling Castle. What kind of a weapon was Warwolf? What are we doing? Are you, you want to go up there now? Yeah. Do you yes. think you'd better take a pair of pliers up in case the... Hugh Kennedy is a Shropshire landowner and medieval armor expert. Ten years ago, he became intrigued by a picture of a machine drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. It appeared to be a device for throwing dead horses called a trebuchet. Inspired by the power of a machine that could hurl such heavy missiles, Hugh decided to try building one himself. A quest which eventually led to this piano-flinging contraption. A mechanized catapult made from a laminated beam, scrap metal, telephone poles, and steel cable. In essence, a trebuchet is a giant seesaw with a very heavy weight at one end and a much lighter missile attached to the other. As the heavier weight drops, the lighter projectile is whipped by its sling towards the enemy. 
Hugh is convinced that Warwolf, Edward's great wall-busting siege engine, must have been a trebuchet. If you chuck a thing that heavy at a stone wall, it'll shatter it. Stone missiles are a lot more effective than grand pianos. To test out Hugh's confidence in the destructive capability of a medieval trebuchet, Nova is preparing some hard sandstone balls weighing 250 pounds. And a wall. It's made of sandstone and lime mortar. In construction and design, it is based on the upper section of a typical castle wall of the 13th century. Hugh wants to build a trebuchet capable of knocking it down. But at a range of 200 yards, it will require precision as well as brute force. Point of view. Yeah. It's much more aerodynamic. Michael for, Prestwich, yeah, a medieval historian, will ensure that Hugh's next trebuchet will be based on an authentic 13th century design. And I suppose it's when it's got to the top of its trajectory and it starts coming down yeah. again, and it really looks quite frightening. Yeah. But I'm glad I wasn't standing underneath it. It'd <laughs> bust up a building all right, again. wouldn't it? It's the first time I've seen a full-scale trebuchet in operation. To see the high trajectory of it and the way the, the, the missile and the sheer speed with which it falls, it's a fantastic sight. Trebuchets began in the Far East, in China, um, but what they were there were hand-pulled machines worked by quite large teams of men. Prepare to loose, loose! In many ways, quite limited in what they could do. The big advance came when Arab engineers got hold of these devices and put a big counterweight on so that instead of teams of men pulling it, the beam was pulled down by a great counterweight. They were far more potent and far more effective. These machines were picked up by Western engineers, uh, and by the middle of the 13th century, um, it's very clear that uh, French, English engineers were capable of building really quite large machines. Some of the best military engineers were employed by Edward I, a master of military tactics. He was one of the most vicious and single-minded rulers of his time. Soon after descending the throne in 1274, Edward decided to squash Welsh independence and bring Wales under his personal rule. He was a bully, frankly, um, and I think many people would think of him as, as a really nasty piece of work. He was utterly determined. Uh, nothing was going to get in his way. Edward's strategy was to ring the mountain stronghold of the Welsh prince with a chain of powerful castles. Richard Holmes is an historian of military tactics. He built eight new big castles, which were really state-of-the-art. They were immensely strong, well thought out. And most of them could be supplied by water, so they were very difficult for the Welsh to besiege. And Edward believed that you control the countryside by castles like this. They're like nails holding the landscape down and their garrisons could issue out, uh, attack enemies in the area. And until the castle was taken, nobody could really dominate that landscape. They were extraordinarily expensive to build and were a very severe drain on the Royal Exchequer. In the short term, though, they worked. Edward and other English lords designed their Welsh strongholds with the trebuchet in mind. For example, Caerphilly Castle was surrounded by man-made lakes, which kept the besieging army and their siege weapons at a distance. Castles were what modern tacticians would call force multipliers. They enabled a relatively small garrison to operate to the absolute maximum of effectiveness. And a castle like this is carefully organized to maximize defensive firepower. There are loopholes in the walls in the towers for archers to shoot through. And here, the walls are cunningly organized so that the second set of walls is higher than the first. And therefore, an attacker facing this face of the castle not only gets the defensive fire of the first wall, but he's got archers shooting at him from the higher walls behind it. It's a real nightmare. 
At the end of the 13th century, what was the effective range of an archer? And what was the effective range of a trebuchet? The historical reports differ. Hugh, how close are you going to have to bring your trebuchet to the walls to do serious damage, do you think? Probably 200 yards. We will be need to be within that to smash it up. At 200 yards, is Hugh's trebuchet out of range of archers defending the castle? To find out, a dummy representing the trebuchet's chief operator is placed at that distance. I'm sure an arrow would land amongst us if we're at that range. That you can easily shoot 200 yards with that massive bow of yours, mm. can't you? Yeah, well, but, uh, 300 yards. Yes. Well, for 200 yards, I think it would be putting you a bit worried, wouldn't it? If it would. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I'm the first to accept that from, from this sort of range, the trebuchet would be doing serious damage to the castle walls. But I think this does suggest that it's no easy business, and the garrison that knows its business can probably keep a trebuchet at the very limit of its range. And the fact that we had some going over the top, yep. I think, is, is, is mighty hopeful from the archer's point of view. Mm. I wonder what happens if you slap one into him from here. Good air, come on, man. Yeah, it's all right, he swallowed it, hasn't he? <laughs> gone, gone right through, right through the dummy, kept only in by the fletchings. Bit of a belly ache, I reckon, yeah. Edward's castle building campaign in Wales had taught him how to design well-defended fortresses. Turning his attention to conquering Scotland, did Edward also have the ability to successfully attack them? As the king marched northwards to take the castles that guarded Scotland, he brought with him some of the biggest siege engines or trebuchets ever built. The siege of Calaverock, conducted by Edward I in, in 1300, we've got, remarkably, a really good account of this, a contemporary poem. It describes the way in which the knights rode up to the castle, all in their great armor, uh, trying to perform great deeds of valor. In fact, they were driven back by the garrison, hurling stones and such like at them. And it wasn't the knights, it wasn't these people with the great acts of bravery. It was the engineers, men of really quite low social status in comparison uh, with the great siege engines. It was they who compelled the garrison to 